afternoon, everyone. Um, welcome uh, to this session. I'm excited to talk about this, uh, this session, especially following Alejandra's presentation on the orange economy. Um, just a little introduction. I'm Edwin Frondozo. I'm the host of the award-winning Business Leadership Podcast, also entrepreneur uh, for Slingshot VoIP. So through the podcast, I actually get the opportunity to speak to amazing business leaders and talk about their thoughts and insights about different business models and, and also within the creative industry as well. Uh, we got an amazing panel of guests here. I'm going to actually give them a minute to introduce themselves as well, but this session will focus on the startups from the creative industries and how to help them identify business models in this sector. So it's a good segue from last panel. And we do have time, Miriam, we have time for a Q&A at the end. Yeah. Yeah, so this will be interactive as well, so if you do have questions, just note it down or, and uh, we'll pass the mics around. Um, before further ado, Anna. Okay, thank you very much. And Miriam, thank you so much for inviting me to be part of this um, amazing event. And I thoroughly enjoyed Alejandra's um, presentation and I'm happy to be here with Salvador. <laughs> so um, uh, my name is Anna Serrano and uh, I actually have been traveling to various parts of Latin America as part of my job. And every time uh, I go, I try to set up meetings, and they always assume that I can speak Spanish. <laughs> so uh, my, my big apologies. Me no habla español, um, pero my name is obviously sp half Spanish. So I'm Filipino uh, with Spanish roots. Um, but I, unfortunately, I'm not a good Spanish speaker. But <laughs> so, but I'm the current uh, chief G digital officer of the Canadian Film Center. I'm also managing director of our accelerator of Canada's only uh, vertical accelerator focused on media and entertainment and technology startups. So we're squarely about the orange economy, and um, and we've been running this accelerator for the past seven years. We have about 90 companies in our portfolio and um, we run pre-accelerator programs where we aggregate companies um, from around the country with special emphasis on Ontario, so the regional um, companies in the media entertainment space. So that pre-accelerator program is called Network Connect. We also have an accelerator boot camp, which is where we uh, make investments, um, and we uh, invite the companies in our pre-accelerator program to go into that um, boot camp called, uh, well, it's just our accelerator boot camp that lasts for four months. Um, and we have um, commercialization labs as well as production labs, because being um, the Canadian Film Center, uh, what makes us a unique accelerator is not only do we help support the businesses that are in the media entertainment sphere, but we also match them with creative talent so that we can actually create best practice contents um, uh, that use the technologies that they're developing. And lastly, um, we have a strong emphasis too on global um, alliances because uh, Canada, like many countries in Latin America, uh, is a small, too small a market. So we actually have to think about um, where the products and services are going to be commercialized around the world. So hence, we do quite a number of startup exchanges um, around the world. So that's a, that's a, that's a good intro, and um, I'll hand it over to you, Salvador. Th thank you, Emma. <laughs> uh, thank you, Miriam. Th thank you for the invitation. The first thing that I have to say, I'm very, very honored to be with Anna. I mean, I'm a big fan of her work, and, and she's amazing. And what they do at CFC is amazing. It was a good commercial, no? For sure. I'm an advertising guy, so I haven't tried to advertise what she does. No, but the, um, uh, I, uh, I have two hats here, because one, I have a, a my name is Salvador Alniz, so, and I'm, I'm originally from Mexico. I've been here 12 years. and. I opened here a TV production company it used to be doing marketing and then I became, by accident, I became a, a, a TV producer in Mexico with certain fortune, but that at the end, we, I end, we, my wife and I ended here in, in, in Toronto and we opened a, a TV production company and we worked for, for the TV, for the, for the broadcasting uh, industry for a while. And three years ago, we started a new venture uh, working with artists and uh, and academics and people in the in the cultural side 
and this venture is called the Institute for Creative Exchange. We do we work with creative companies, with creative minds, with artists to do exchange and to favor international mobility among artists and institutions and organizations. And we also do a little bit of cultural diplomacy and we work with governments to help them to to get into agreements with, with other countries or other institutions to facilitate this movement of, of creative thinking and creative minds in, in, in the Americas originally. Now we're working a bit with, with some Spanish uh, institutions and, 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 uh, and groups. So that's well. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. I guess we'll just get started uh, just to open up the conversation. Um, if we could actually just describe what the startup ecosystem looks like within the orange economy or within the creative space. Should I start? Okay. I'll share some stuff that um, probably, um, uh, uh, you know, I'm not supposed to be saying <laughs> out loud. Okay. And so uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that, you know, Toronto and Ontario has a lot of creative um, folks here, obviously. So this is, you know, the production studios. So the studios, which are Disney's and um, Netflix and um, our core uh, studio part, uh, 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 you know, local studio folks like Pinewood, etc., who make film and television and things like that. That business is booming, right? So there's a lot of stuff happening, in, and as you can see, buildings are being built. So the architectural business is booming. We have um, art. Uh, are lots of art um, uh, neighborhoods, et cetera, that's booming. So on, on the one hand, when you look at the, um, the kind of ecosystem, the orange economy ecosystem in Ontario, let's just speak about Ontario and Toronto, you would say, wow, this is a really vibrant, amazing scene. And in many ways it is, okay? What makes it slightly different and what makes me slightly envious of places like Latin America or places like France or places like uh, things like that is um, the, the, the orange economy is too much framed in terms of creative industries in Canada versus um, cultural and artistic and creative industries. So when the, the way Alejandra described the orange economy in Latin America, it's very much um, um, uh, sort of anchored around art and culture. Uh, when people describe the creative economy in Ontario, it's very much anchored around um, the creative sectors that actually uh, generate a lot of wealth with some lip service paid to the design and art and culture spaces. So we, I would say that what makes the orange economy startup ecosystem different in Toronto is we don't have as good um, a branding, you know, that was, the, that was really what um, gave, uh, uh, th that's what really made the, or made, uh, c the Colombian president's, um, unique, uh, uh, weight to framing creative entrepreneurship as the orange economy. He was able to brand it so that it feels really like it's a, it's a, a, a harmonized, whole, um, a single purpose kind of set of companies that are driving towards a set of values which Alejandra really articulated quite well, which is it does create jobs, it does create wealth, but it also has some kind of cultural impact, right? The framing of creative entrepreneurship in the Richard Floridian terms, Richard Florida, the guy who wrote The Creative Economy, etc., and really framing it more as creative industries doesn't have the same branded um, feel. So to that extent, I would say um, uh, our startup ecosystem in this space tends to be a lot more fragmented and you can't have that same sense of harmonious, holistic, um, uh, you know, branded feel. I'd love to hear what Salvador thinks about that. I absolutely yeah. agree with, yeah. with what Anna, Anna said. Uh, when I was, when, when my wife and I arrived, I'm, I'm a writer, well, and my, my wife is a photographer, and the first thing that we asked a friend was, where are the writers? Where do they meet? Yeah. You see, Latin America, for, for you, for some of you that are from, from, the, from Latin America, you will understand that, that uh, the, you go to certain cafes or bars, and then you have a beer, and then you meet a lot of writers, you know, 
co colleagues, and, and you get into, in touch and get, then you exchange ideas. This is something that here, that doesn't happen like, like that. I mean, it, it happens, eventually it happens. It's not that it's, it's, the, the people is not isolated, but it's more difficult to have this kind of exchange. No? That's one of the, thing that, the, the things that happen. And it's the same in terms of the organization. It's, everything is very well structured. And I think that the main difference with the, with the, with the creative economies, for saying, for talking it like that in, in Latin America, is, is more organic. Uh, there's one case that for me is really is, is, is really amazing, which is the, the case of uh, a, a Grupo W. The, the Grupo W is an agency that became one of the most for a while, for a year, they, 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 at the Cannes Festival, they said, this is the most amazing digital agency in the world. And it's, it's an agency that was, uh, was formed in Mexico, in, in Torreón, which is a, it's a small city in the north of Mexico. I talked to, the, to, to, to one of the owners, and he said, you know how we started? We were bored. I had a, my, my, my grandfather had a house, abandoned house, and, they, and it had nothing but a billiards uh, table, a pool table. And, and just the guys wanted to play billiards and drink beer. So I just opened the, the house and they started to collaborate there. And they started to do like a, a, lot of, like a lot of work. And then they became the Coca-Cola agency of record for digital business, so like worldwide. So it's, that's the way it works. It's more casual. Here, there's a lot more structure, which has pros and cons. No, there's like more profession, professionalization in one hand, yeah. in one hand, or in the other. It's the, the, it lacks a, sometimes a little bit of spontane, uh, spontaneity. Yeah. No, no. Yeah, no, absolutely. And and part of the issue has to do. Does this work? Hello. Um, no. Hello. Hello. Oh, there. So part of the issue has to do with how creative. Um, ideation and um, true partnership actually evolves, right? So next week, there's a major conference taking place, and it's called Collisions, right? Um, to me, that's one of the best sort of names for the type of conference that they want to create, because what you really want to do is to create collisions of interest, collisions of diverse, you know, diverse disciplines, collisions of, um, of people, and through colliding, um, uh, emergent ideas begin, emergent business relationships begin, etc. So in a system like um, Alejandra, I was just saying that, you know, Ontario, I, I'm, I'm very envious of, of the framing of the orange economy in Latin America because you were able to create or uh, a frame that allows you to brand the whole thing but still maintain the kind of emergent organic nature of how things occur. Um, while it's in Ontario, although there's lots of wealth being generated by the various verticals in the creative industries, they tend to be siloed. So the collisions that can take place between the film industry and the industrial design industry and the um, uh, you know writing industry or the writers, et cetera, hardly happens um, here. And so part of what we want to do at the, the CFC Media Lab is to facilitate that type of collision. And a really good example of what you just um, uh, talked about is I was just in Buenos Aires recently um, and, and I was speaking with Fabian from Cella, which is this major um, uh, sort of building, you've been there, yeah. It's incredible sort of factory that he bought um, and so we're trying to figure out, so how do we bring UCLA computer engineering um, folks with um, uh, immersive media startups that we're supporting in the Media Lab, um, OCAD U design students, and maybe Salvador's artists from Mexico all coming together in this one facility to try to create different things. That's the type of stuff that I think can be real, um, ma is where ca magic can happen in an ecosystem. And so part of, to answer your question, part of the challenge is how do we ensure that we map out ecosystems but make them, f make them still have that organic feel and that ability to allow for emergent um, ideas to happen. I mean, that's super fascinating. I come from the tech entrepreneurship world 10 years, 15 years ago when I started as an entrepreneur. There was no tech entrepreneur ecosystem, really. 
I mean, I just went out and bootstrapped. So I'm wondering, is there any, I'd love to get your insights from that. Like, what can you learn from what the tech industry did here in Toronto to make it more organic and to grow and having Collision come to Toronto? Is there anything that you're borrowing? Are you seeing that something that could happen within Ontario? Well, one, one thing that, that, uh, that the creative, creatives can learn from the, tech, uh, from the tech world is the way, sorry, that, like that? Yeah. <laughs> is it off? Ah. It's a technical thing. Like this, wow. <laughs> I, I, was, I was feeling like... Um, so one of the um, one of the things that we have to learn is 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 how to present how how to be more business oriented. I think it's something that we have to learn in general. No, and and it's not only in Latin America. I think that everywhere. No, and but also one of the one of the things that and and that's why I was asking you this thing of the amalgamation and what, why this this idea of the collision is it's something that is interesting for for a for creative companies or creative uh, enterprises in general, is that sometimes it's difficult to have everything under one roof for the, on the creative side. And some, sometimes, the, most of the time, creative work is complementary. I mean, you can put one guy doing one thing and the other one doing another one and putting them together then you can make a viable business model. This is something that, I, that I've been finding. And it's something that in the technology, the, I mean, you do that. I mean, and, but it's more, like, it's easier, I don't know. You do it more like a, as a natural process. No? You need certain component and you just, whether you get the guy to do it or you buy the technology from some, somewhere else. And it's something that in, on the creative side, sometimes we are very reluctant to do. And I think that there should be a way or like kind of a central intelligence <laughs> to put all these pieces together, the pieces of the puzzle. I don't know if, it, because I think that this idea of the collision is part of this, that's the idea, or centers that put together people to work, you not know, and, and, and trying to get like a common product. That's probably one solution. And if, if we take it to an extreme, I think that would, we would find like a very good surprise because if if you put more people with more power together with different points of view maybe you can get something more meaningful no? well I think that um, uh, where we're at right now is both um, industry sectors are flawed so um, I don't believe that there's some magic in the tech industry that somehow creatives don't know anything about and we need to somehow look at them and figure out how to be more like them. Um, in the same way, I don't think the creatives have all of the answers and then the tech industry needs to, to get that from them. But if I were to choose different ones from each one, the way I would do it is that the one thing that I think um, uh, creative uh, industry folks are very poor at is um, including audiences in the collisions. So, uh, so that's one thing that I think the uh, user-centered design practices of um, technology firms have done quite well, although, you know, Facebook, if, I mean, how, how good is Facebook really at, at user-centeredness um, outside of, uh, you know, if we, if we think about the, the unintended consequences that have, have emerged from their platform, right? So having said that, um, they have been very good at including audiences or their customers into the product development process. And I think that's something that creative industry folks typically don't do. Um, because most of the time when we're thinking about making our stuff, we're making our stuff in this kind of creative vacuum, either collaboratively with other people or um, for ourselves. And the notion that somehow audiences have a big role to play in how we do our creative development, usually it doesn't come, come up for us. Um, in the case of, would you say that's true for you for you guys? Yeah. So, so trying to build in... Um, uh, uh, environments that include customers and audiences in the mix, in the product development mix, I think is a, is a critical piece. Thank you. I just wanted to, since, since we're on a panel on business models, and I know we have a lot of entrepreneurs and startups in the room, I'm like, what advice would you give to them in terms of those, just given what you said in terms of getting customer feedback, when I'm launching, what type of business do I roll? Because, I mean, that's I come from the tech world, so it's all about 
feedback and making sure that I could sell this five times, 10 times, 100 times. So what would you say to the startups out there right now or the entrepreneurs who are getting into this space to, to build a business? Um, well, to, to go back to the uh, conversation that Alejandro and Salvador were having earlier around um, the small companies and the kind of notion of the holding company or the association that brings all of these creative companies together, I think one of the more interesting business models emerging um, is, the, is the platform cooperative model. Okay, and so um, what that is, is like right now we know that the platform monopoly model where um, you have to have the highest number, you know, you're, you're typically the early, early adopter or the um, f early, um, that's not the word I'm looking for, you're like first to market with a particular technology and then you, you basically have a land grab of users and then because you have the most amount of users through network effect, you become the monopoly. That's kind of dead. Like that's that's not going to happen again, right? And so, and also, plus the whole idea that monopolies, um, monopolistic practices are the way to go, is is also likely becoming less and less um, uh, uh, attractive as regulation is going to start to to catch up with what's going on with the tech, with the digital network society. So as a result of that, lots of people are trying to come up with new business models that are going to pay attention to the new regulatory environments that are taking place. And one such model is the platform cooperative where, um, where the ownership of, of the IP and or the profits and or the revenues are shared amongst a variety of the, of the either creators or even sometimes with the users. A good example of this is, um, uh, let's talk about sharing economy technology firms like Uber, et cetera. Um, lots of new ride sharing platforms are emerging where the drivers co-own the business. So any type of sharing economy model where you might co where, where you're you're adding value to um, your part is uh, in the business adds value, you could be a part owner of that business. So in the case of the creative industries, um, you know, um, some of the models that are emerging are things like a Stocksy, which is a company out in Vancouver, where photographers um, and photographs and visual media are aggregated, and all of the photographers co-own that business. And you can have different forms where, you know, how decisions get made might be changed, et cetera. But if you're really interested in that particular business model, the guy who's driving it is Trevor Schultz from the New School for Social Research in New York, mm -hmm. and he has a toolkit called the Platform Cooperative Toolkit that, that you can check out. Yes, that, and, and for me, that's, that's, a, that's a model that for me, it's, it's been in, very interesting for, men, for a long time. I think that the idea of aggregating or, or putting together like uh, different points of view to to prepare a product is probably a good way to go in terms of the of the creative side not only because of the creative thinking but also in terms of the execution i remember that uh, when, when for instance when you talk to an architect there was a time when you were talking to an architect and for the for an architect when when the when the building was finished it was almost like uh, you know what it's beautiful, but it has all these problems, structural problems, and it's not well built. And it was almost as, as if the building was something that, a disgrace that happened to the architect, no? Because the pure idea was the perfect idea, and then the execution was not perfect. I think that this is gone. I mean, it's something that is not acceptable in any, in any creative product. And I think that the idea of putting together people working, you will need somebody in, in a different discipline to work. It's something that you do very well. I mean, in, the, in all the labs that you do, that you have technology assistants and you have uh, experts in very specific, uh, manu let's say manufacturing not, uh, te uh, or, uh, uh, technology that help, help the, the, the artist or the, or the creatives to, to execute their, their, their products, no? Um. I got one more question because I want to leave some time for Q&A, um, given that there are a lot of entrepreneurs who are visiting. So if you, both of you, if you could share some issues, maybe experiences, or something that happened um, with exporting creative products into the Americas. I'll start with Salvador. Uh, yeah, uh, 
there, there are two, two uh, I think that one of the challenges in terms, uh, at the moment of exporting it, or at the moment of doing the exchange, is something that uh, it's, uh, is one of the main concerns that, uh, that in, in my organization we have. It's how we transport or how can we ex export creative products or how can we import the products, no? How can we do this exchange, this trade? And the problem is not only because what the, the first thing that you would say is obviously, I don't know, tropicalization of the forms or, but it goes beyond that. I think that the, that the main challenge is that the, it starts from the concept of exporting the creative product is something that is not necessarily uh, not uh, considered even in the government. I was, I was uh, uh, in the morning. I was talking to John. We were talking to John Tory, and we were saying, I, "I've been exporting creative products for a while." And he said, "You know what? This is something that we don't listen to often, and it's more common than everybody thinks." I mean, the people normally export, and there are a lot of artists, Canadian artists, that are selling products abroad. No, and it. I mean, just the film is like that. No, film is exporting a creative product, but it's not really considered as an as an ex export good. Um, I think that the, the main challenge that I see is like a kind of a platform to support the export, the export for, 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 for creative products in general. Um, well, my example has to do with a lot of the work we do um, in terms of the matchmaking, the global matchmaking. So um, part of, I think, what's really necessary is more spaces where I, I don't, mean to repeat myself, but where collisions can happen, right? So, um, so for example, I get invited a lot to jury in festivals in, in, in many places, including Latin America. I was part of the Ventana Sur um, immersive media jury. Um, at that particular um, year, we then uh, uh, gave the award to an Argentinian animation firm called Gloomy Eyes. Um, because Ventana Sur was, was very much a partner to Virtuality, which is a, an um, immersive media conference that started in France, um, they, they said that whoever won that particular film prize gets to go to Paris to virtuality there. There, um, it, they met with Atlas V, an immersive media um, company, who then ended up producing it, and this thing ended up going to Sundance, and this thing. So there's, that's kind of how this whole stuff works, right? Which is, um, first you need, um, uh, you need a facilitator, so facilitation lab, person, center, festival, et cetera, um, who enables sort of the ease, uh, the frictionless meeting of various um, potential partners. Um, the funding partners for that uh, differ. Uh, we're very lucky in Canada because the Canadian Media Fund has developed a set of um, relationships with various countries um, where small pots of money are there just for co-productions. So they have one with Colombia, they have one with France, they have one with, with, with Luxembourg, etc. So there's a variety of them. So that helps um, grease the frictionless meeting, right? So now you've got co-productions. And then, and then you have distribution channels that can enable um, for these um, co-productions to actually find other distribution in other places. So you really do need an uh, ecosystem approach to um, uh, this kind of export activities. And it requires a number of people working um, in a kind of integrated way to make that happen. And so, uh, and so if anyone's in the audience who are interested in this kind of matchmaking, this can happen within different media types from you know, film to VR to um, a whole variety of creative industries. Awesome, thank you very much.